All right, as John introduced, um, the title of my talk today is Does Biodiversity Confer a Degree of Ecological Insurance? Um, this is part of my PhD research that was done at uh, James Cook University, node of the Centre of Excellence, under the supervision of Professor Dave Bellwood, who's in the audience over here. So, <coughs> biodiversity has long been argued to be a source of ecological stability, with increasing species richness providing a degree of insurance or resilience against both um, natural and anthropogenic stresses. Now, whilst this, this relationship can be quite complex, increasing species richness is generally assumed to increase both the, diverse, the interspecific diversity of responses to environmental change, that is, the response diversity, and also increase the number of species that contribute to any particular e e uh, sorry, ecological function, that is, functional redundancy. Now, for this talk today, I'll primarily be focusing on the second of those, that of functional redundancy. Now, over the last few decades, uh, the deteriorating health of many of the world's ecosystems has really raised questions about the role of biodiversity in providing that ecological stability or e ecosystem functions. Now, if we just consider a relatively simple example, now, obviously, we don't see this very much often in the real world, but if we consider an example where we've got one predatory species, one herbivorous species, and one species of algae, or even an algal community down the bottom there, now, each of these is exerting top-down pressure on the, the component below it. So the predator's exerting pressure on the herbivore, the herbivore's exerting pressure on the, on the algae community. If we remove one of those out of that system, so if we take the herbivore out, suddenly we've lost that entire process. So the algal community's released from that top-down pressure, that top-down control, and suddenly expands. As we add species to the system, what we're expecting is that the number of species contributing to any of one of those functions actually also increases. So as you add a species, it might be a predator, it might be a herbivore, etc. What we see now, if we remove that same herbivore, is the likelihood that those remaining species will be able to compensate for that loss. So you're still maintaining that function. That algal community is still kept under control by the herbivores, even though we've lost that single species. So that's the concept that I'm going to be looking at primarily today. But in the context <coughs> of coral reef ecosystems, obviously we know coral reefs are one of the most biologically diverse ecosystems in the world. But over the past few decades, we've seen repeated examples of where these coral-dominated systems have rapidly shifted or undergone a phase shift or a transition to a state dominated by fleshy or leathery macroalgae. Now, this has occurred in the Caribbean, Hawaii, and East African reefs. And in each of these examples, the actual trigger that's caused the coral mortality and for the system to flip has actually differed. It's been the loss or the overfishing of herbivores that's underpinned the demise of these systems. So herbivores are acknowledged to be a critical group on coral reefs. Now, Terry and colleagues um, within the centre, also on the GBR, experimentally excluded herbivorous fishes from large areas of the reef for two and a half years and were actually able to induce a shift or induce a phase shift to macroalgal dominance. Now, if you look at the, the photo in the bottom corner, bottom right-hand corner, what you see in the foreground is what's developed inside the cages over that two and a half year period. And what it is, it's a two to three metre high canopy of sargassum or a leathery macroalgae, whilst outside the cages, you've still got a system dominated by coral and closely cropped algal turf. So the herbivore community is keeping that outside crop down. Once established, these phase shifts appear to be relatively hard to reverse. Now, it's partially because a lot of the herbivores don't actually eat the macroalgae, and I'll get to that in a second. But also the macroalgae themselves suppresses the growth, mortality, and recruitment of corals, further limiting the capacity of this system to actually recover. So hence, the removal of macroalgae is actually seen as a critical process, especially those of the fleshy and large leathery macroalgae, as you can see in the picture, as a critical process on coral reefs. So several recent studies... Several recent studies from Dave, Dave Bellwood's lab have looked at this process and collectively they've established that relatively few species are actually capable of removing this leathery macroalgae or sargassum. And they come from, you may have heard in the media, the top one there is the rabbitfish, Saganus canaliculatus, moving down the Kyphosa, Kyphosis vagiensis, and of course down the bottom we've got the batfish, Platax panatus. Whilst these studies have, have provided useful information, all of them have been restricted to this, just near that yellow dot there, to one island, Orpheus Island, just north of Townsville, 
an in- inshore reef and the GBR and the central GBR, most of them conducted within a single bay, and a lot of them within a single habitat within that bay. So whilst all this information has been really useful, if we look at the Barrier Reef, much of it's further offshore. We already know that there's large variations in benthic community structure, herbivorous community structure and ecosystem processes, both among habitats within a single reef, but the, the largest gradient we get is actually across the continental shelf, and we see most of those reefs are further offshore. So that moves on to the research, some of the research questions that I was addressing for my PhD is looking at those broader scale patterns. So specifically what I'm going to talk about today is do the removal rates or the process of macroalgal removal vary across those broader spatial scales, specifically among habitats on a mid-shelf reef and then across the entire continental shelf. But perhaps more importantly, identifying the species that are actually doing that job. And the expectation was if there's a lot of variation in the fish community structures across both of these scales, then you'd expect the species that's actually responsible for these functions is going to vary across those scales as well. So what we're trying to look at is which one's removing it. To do it, <coughs> I simply use a, um, a technique, macroalgal bioassays or transplanting macroalgae. Now I worked in the northern part of the GBR, which is indicated by that red box up here. Collected the sargassum from the inshore reefs in the turtle group where it's locally abundant. So on the GBR, Sargassum is typically abundant inshore, less abundant as we move further offshore. Collected it, took it to Lizard Island and transplanted it for eight hours um, at two sites within each of the six habitats and they're indicated by those yellow dots all around Lizard Island. Now these habitats represent a range of wave exposures, depths, to encompass basically all the typical coral reef habitats that you'll find. So just moving straight into the results, what did I find? Now this figure... I'll just explain briefly. On the vertical axis, we've got the actual proportion of macroalgae that was removed in an eight-hour period. And across the bottom, we've got the six habitats moving from the left is the sheltered habitats across to the exposed habitats on the right. Now, what we found was, I guess it's good news, especially in the exposed habitats, there was high rates of macroalgae removal. So I was putting out quite a few pieces of this macroalgae, about half a kilo each, came back eight hours later. And what we've seen is, I've gone from that top image there You've got a large piece, come back, and it's basically all been removed within that eight-hour period. Great news. So within the exposed habitats, 80 to 90% removed in an eight-hour period. It dropped off significantly, but we're still getting 20 to 30% removal in those sheltered habitats around the, the leeward side of the island. The traditional approach was then, OK, we've, we've documented the process, so who's actually doing the job? So we go out and we would look at the distribution of herbivorous fishes usually from underwater visual censuses. What we've got here is the results of underwater visual censuses at each of those habitats. And what I'm presenting is just those fishes that have been identified to eat this, either through video observations or gut content analysis. And the interesting thing here is where we're getting the high rates of removal of macroalgae, we've actually got the lowest abundance of these fishes and vice versa. In the sheltered habitats where we're getting the low removal rates, we've got the highest density of fishes. So the question really remains, which species or which species are actually removing the macroalgae? So I'm just going to show you some of the video footage from these. And just for reference, down in the bottom corner, I've still got those density estimates from the underwater visual census. Hopefully this works. So this is from the reef crest. And what I found was <clears throat> you put the algae out, large schools of this species here, which is a blue spine unicorn fish, nasal unicornis, came in and basically rapidly ate down that, that macroalgae. Okay, that's probably to be expected. What we see in that habitat is it was the dominant browser from the visual censuses. We move along to the next habitat, the reef flat, very low densities, but again, what we're seeing is that same species coming in. <clears throat> schools of up to, I think it was 16 or 18 individuals coming in and rapidly removing the macroalgae. So it was basically all removed within that eight hour period. I won't go through and bore you with the video from each of the other habitats. I'll just show you a summary of what we found. Now this is, again, those habitats across the horizontal axis. On the vertical axis, it's standardised bites. Now, just to explain that briefly, if you've got a small fish, it's going to take a small bite. Larger fish, take a larger bite. So just standardising for the size of the fish and the bites they're going to take. So in total, I recorded over 42,000 bites from approximately 38 species feeding on this. But that one species, Nasa unicornis, accounted 
accounted for approximately 90% of all bytes and 95% of all mass standardized bytes. So it was the only species related to the reduction in the algal biomass across those six habitats. But I guess you could argue, okay, one species of macroalga, one species of fish. So what? What does it mean? So to look at some of the generalities of that pattern, I actually repeated the experiment, this time using nine species of macroalgae um, from four genera, so Sargassum, Turbinaria, Cystocera, and Hormophysa. What I'm going to present today is very preliminary results from this, um, and it was just restricted to those habitats with the higher rates of removal on the exposed side of the island. So if we look at removal rates, what we've got here across the bottom, we've just got the species, and just for reference, that first bar represents the species that I'd used previously, Sargassum schwartzii. Again, algal mass on the vertical axis, and the three habitats represent the three different panels. Now, general, with the exception of two species, which are the first two in the figures over here, Turbinaria ornata and Sargassum cristofolium, with the exception of those two, removal rates were very high for all species. Um, if anyone's interested, I can talk about why I think they're getting lower removal rates. But again, who was doing the removing? I won't show you video, but what we're finding, again, don't look too much at the magnitude of the differences in those bars. A lot of that's related to the algal biomass. So some of the species were quite small, some were quite tall. So obviously you're going to get more bites when there's more biomass available. What I want you to concentrate on is the relative contribution of each of the species. Nasal unicornis, again, indicated in blue. What we're seeing, again, from over 12,000 bites, now this is just one day's replica. I haven't had time to go through all the video for this. Nasal unicornis accounted for over 96% of all the bites. So not only is it feeding across all the habitats, but it's feed, feeding on all nine species of algae. As I mentioned, the greatest gradient we get is across the continental shelf. So to look at that, Again, I again repeated this experiment, but this time using two reefs within each of four shelf locations. Now, I've used the traditional shelf locations of inner, inner shelf, mid shelf, and outer shelf, but I also included these ones down the bottom there, the intermediate. Now, they are relatively co close to the coast, but they're more typical in structure and the fish community of a mid shelf habitat. So that was just to see if there was any transition between those true inner and true mid shelf reefs. Again, transplanted the algae, left there for five hours. Video. What do we find? Okay, on those inner shelf reefs, the rate of removal or the rate of the process was actually a lot lower, and that appears to be related to the actual availability of macroalgae within those habitats already. As I mentioned, I was collecting a lot of this from the inshore reefs, so there's already a lot of macroalgae there, hence the availability may be affecting what we're getting. We still got those high removal rates on the two mid shelf reefs, and it dropped off slightly on the outer shelf. Um, I should mention in all of these, I did con conduct controls with cages to exclude herbivore access. So it's not actually the physical process or wave action that's causing this reduction. It's, it is all related to the fish feeding. So we've seen what happens on a mid-shelf reef, or at least for Lizard Island. What about on the outer? So again, I'll just show you a short video clip. This is from the outer crest, so the very outer edge of the GBR. No, it's not the shark's going to feed. Um, but again, what we're seeing is this one species of, of unicorn fish coming in and feeding extensively on the macroalgae. There's a, actually another couple, I don't know if you can see them, there's a, a different species amongst them, comes in, generally doesn't actually feed on the sargassum, it just swims around in the schooling group with them. It does take a couple of bites, but generally not much. Again, overall, what do we see? Okay, over 82,000 bites from 42 different species that were absorbed observed feeding on the sargassum across those eight reefs. Again, nasal unicornis, 82% of the mass standardised bites across the entire shelf. So what it actually appears is that this process, this process of macroalgal removal that we're viewing as being a critical process on coral reefs is dominated by a single species, at least in this area of the Great Barrier Reef, suggesting that there is limited functional redundancy. If we actually lose that species, we could actually be losing the whole process from the reef. Okay, so at least in this instance and at these locations, biodiversity isn't being related to ecological insurance. If we lose it, we lose the whole process. So some of the management strategies may need to look beyond the preservation of bio biodiversity alone and look to the protection of key species in critical functional groups. And I just want to finish on a bit of a sobering note in that 
Asia unicornis is a very widespread species. It occurs from the Red Sea to French Polynesia, from Lord Howe Island up to southern Japan. <clears throat> now, throughout its range, it's actually heavily targeted by fishers. On the GBR, we don't have any fishery or any extensive fishery for any of the herbivores. Um, some spear fishermen may take some, but generally our reefs are intact as far as herbivore populations go. The same can't be said for a lot of these other locations. They may have already unwittingly removed one of their agents of regeneration that's going to ma manifest as we get more and more disturbances on these reef ecosystems. There's obviously just a few people I need to acknowledge, um, especially the centre for supporting this research um, and a, a heap of volunteers, that are, many of which are in the audience. Thank you.